The New York Post from July 25, 1979 opens with the headline on the front page, Love Bite Killer May Take Grizzly Secret to Grave, making a reference to the tactics Bundy used to lure in his victims. A conventionally attractive and charming man, Ted Bundy was able to use his looks and personality to attract young girls. Even the newspaper article includes a relatively nice photograph of him, rather than the typical police mug shot that is often associated with criminal reports. He was a man that most didn't believe was capable of committing mass murder, due to his seemingly normal personality and appearance. While Bundy admitted to 30 murders before his death, the actual number of girls he killed has not been confirmed. He went against the stereotype that there was something obviously criminal about a person to make them commit such crimes. Bundy didn't have a criminal record. He had a college degree and was a friendly man. He was far from appearing like the mass murderers that came before him. The notion that he may take his grisly secret to the grave may refer to the possibility that Bundy could have gotten away with his crimes due to his character and charming personality. Have you ever physically harmed anyone? Ever physically harmed anyone? No. No. You know, uh, again, not in the context I think that you, you're speaking of. Welcome to another video. In this video, we will take you back to 1978 when a handsome guy named Ted Bundy was caught and found guilty of more than 30 female victims. So, let's get started. Before going directly to the crimes, the first question that comes to our mind is, who was Ted Bundy and what kind of early life did he spend? Was his life traumatic or normal? Were there any events in his early childhood that led to this situation? Well, he did not have a very good relationship with his stepfather, and they both struggled to get along. Ted Bundy, full name Theodore Robert Bundy, was an American who was born November 24, 1946 in Burlington, Vermont. Bundy had a difficult childhood. His biological father's identity has never been confirmed, his original birth certificate apparently assigns paternity to a salesman an United States Air Force veteran named Lloyd Marshall, though a copy of it lists him as having no father. Louise Cowell, his mother, claimed she met a war veteran named Jack Worthington, who abandoned her soon after she became pregnant. He lived with his grandparents, family, and friends, and even young Ted was told that his grandparents were his parents and that his mother was his older sister. Bundy eventually discovered the truth, although his recollections of the circumstances varied. He told a girlfriend that a cousin showed him a copy of his birth certificate after calling him a bastard. Bundy displayed disturbing behavior from a young age. Julia, Luis's younger sister, recalled waking up from a nap to find herself surrounded by kitchen knives and three-year-old Ted standing by the bed, smiling. Sandy Holt, Bundy's childhood neighbor, described him as a bully, saying he liked to frighten people, he preferred to be in charge. He enjoyed inflicting pain, suffering, and fear. Bundy's mother left the house of his grandparents and moved to live with cousins Alan and Jane Scott in Tacoma, Washington. In 1951, at an adult singles night at Tacoma's First Methodist Church, she met Johnny Culpepper Bundy, 1921-2007, a hospital cook. Later that year, they married, and Johnny formally adopted Ted. Johnny and Louise had four children together, and despite Johnny's efforts to include his adopted son in family activities such as camping trips, Ted remained distant from him. He later told one of his girlfriends that Johnny wasn't his biological father, that he wasn't very bright, and that he didn't make much money. Bundy and his stepfather had a strained relationship, and his shyness made him a frequent target of bullying. However, his intelligence and social skills later allowed him to have a successful college career, and he developed a series of seemingly normal emotional relationships with women. Later, during one of the interviews, Bundy varied his recollections of Tacoma. He remembered roaming his neighborhood, picking through trash barrels in search of pictures of naked women. He also perused detective magazines, crime novels, and true crimes documentaries for stories that involved sexual violence particularly when the stories were illustrated with pictures of dead or maimed women. 
His obsession with assault and women's bodies grew to a level where he recalled himself saying that he would consume large quantities of alcohol and canvass the community late at night in search of underaped windows where he could observe women undressing or whatever else could be seen. If we look at Ted Bundy's social life during his adolescence, we can see that he was not an extrovert and preferred to be alone. He did not make friends, and he also claims that he did not understand why people wanted to make friends. Bundy attended the University of Puget Sound UPS, for one year after graduating from high school in 1965 before transferring to the University of Washington to study Chinese. In 1967, he finally got over that awkward friendship-hating phase and began a romantic relationship with a University of Washington classmate, Diane Edwards, who was identified in Bundy's biographies by several pseudonyms, most commonly Stephanie Brooks. Bundy dropped out of college in early 1968 and worked a series of low-wage jobs. He also volunteered at Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign Seattle office and worked as Arthur Fletcher's driver and bodyguard during Fletcher's campaign for Lieutenant Governor of Washington State. Ted Bundy's personality changed and he became a mass murderer because he attended the 1968 Republican National Convention in Miami as a Rockefeller delegate in August. Shortly after that, Edwards ended their relationship and returned to her family home in California. Frustrated by what he described as Bundy's immaturity and lack of ambition, psychiatrist Dorothy Ottnell Lewis would later pinpoint this crisis as probably the pivotal time in his development. Devastated by the breakup, Bundy traveled to Colorado and then farther east, visiting relatives in Arkansas and Philadelphia and enrolling for one semester at Temple University. It was also at this time in early 1969 that Bundy visited the office of birth records in Burlington and confirmed his true parentage. In 1969, after getting back to Washington, Bundy got involved in another romantic relationship with Elizabeth Klopfer, who was identified as Meg Anders, Beth Archer or Liz Kendall in the literature of Ted Bundy. She was a single mother from Ogden, Utah, who worked as a secretary at the UW School of Medicine. Their stormy relationship would continue well past his initial incarceration in Utah in 1976. Bundy became a father figure to Klopfer's daughter, whose name was Molly. She was three years old when Bundy started dating her mother. He remained in her life until she was 10 years old, after he had been arrested. As an adult, Molly wrote of incidences beginning at age 7 in which Bundy was abusive and sexually inappropriate with her. Her accounts include Bundy hitting her in the face, knocking her down, putting her at risk of drowning, indecent exposure, and sexual touching disguised as accidents or games. But she knew that no father would ever play games like this with her daughter. While in a relationship with Elizabeth, Bundy re-enrolled at UW, this time as a psychology major in the mid-1970s. He was now more focused and goal-oriented. He was recognized as an honor student by his professors. He then began working at Seattle's Suicide Hotline Crisis Center in 1971. There, he met and worked with Ann Rule, a former Seattle police officer and aspiring crime writer who would later write The Stranger Beside Me, one of the definitive Bundy biographies. Bundy's personality did not bother Rule at the time. She described him as a kind, solicitous, and empathetic. Bundy rekindled his relationship with Edwards during a trip to California on Republican Party business in the summer of 1973. She was astounded by his transformation into a serious and dedicated professional on the verge of a significant legal and political career. Bundy continued to date Klopfer as well, and both girls were unaware of each other's existence. In the fall of 1973, he matriculated at UPS Law School and continued courting Edwards, who flew to Seattle several times to stay with him. They discussed marriage, and at one point he introduced her to a friend or a colleague as his fiance. But Bundy abruptly cut off all contact with Edwards on January 1974. Her phone calls and letters went unanswered. A month later, when she finally reached him by phone, she demanded to know why it abruptly ended their relationship without explanation. Diane, I have no idea what you mean, he said flatly before hanging up. He was never heard from again. Bundy later explained, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. 
but Edwards concluded in retrospect that he had pre-planned the entire courtship and rejection as retaliation for the breakup she initiated in 1968. It was after this incident that Bundy started missing classes at law school. As young women began to disappear in the Pacific Northwest, he had stopped attending completely by April of 1974. There is no agreement on when or where Bundy began murdering women. He told different stories to different people and refused to reveal the specifics of his earliest crimes, even as he confessed to dozens of subsequent murders in graphic detail in the days leading up to his executions. On the midnight of January 4, 1974 in Washington, Oregon, Bundy broke into the basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks, also known as Johnny Lenz, Mary Adams, and Terry Caldwell in Bundy literature. A dancer and student of the University of Washington, he sexually assaulted Sparks with either the same rod or a metal speculum after bludgeoning her with a metal rod from her bed frame, causing extensive internal injuries. She remained unconscious in the hospital for 10 days, and although she survived, she was left with physical disabilities. The second case happened in the early morning hours of February 1st. Bundy broke into the basement room of Linda Ann Healy, a UW undergraduate who broadcast morning radio weather reports for skiers. He beat her unconscious, dressed her in blue jeans, a white blouse, and boots, and carried her away. And like this, his murder and sexual assault attempts did not take a break. During the first half of 1974, female college students disappeared at the rate of about one per month. On March 12, Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, left her dormitory to attend a jazz concert on campus but never arrived. Then, on April 17, Susan Elaine Rancor disappeared while on her way to her dorm room after an evening advisors meeting at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, Seattle. Two female Central Washington students later came forward to report encounters, one of the night of Rancor's disappearance, the other three nights earlier with the man wearing a sling who was asking for help carrying a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. On May 6th, Roberta Kathleen Parks left her dorm at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Seattle to meet friends for coffee at the Memorial Union, but she never returned. Seattle and King County investigators became increasingly concerned. There was no significant physical evidence, and the missing women shared little except their appearance. They were all young, attractive white college students with long hair parted in the middle. Although at that time, technology was not that advanced, Ted Bundy had already mastered some skills. In the era before DNA profiling, he left minimal incriminating forensic evidence at crime scenes. The list of all these cases is too long to be discussed in the video, so let's jump to the last strike that Ted Bundy attempted. On February 9, 1978, 7th grader Kimberly Leach disappeared in the middle of the day from Florida's Lake City Junior High School. At 12 years of age, she was significantly younger than Bundy's usual victims. Her body was found two months later under a shed in Suwannee River State Park. It was February 15, 1978, when Pensacola police officer David Lee pulled over a car with no headlights and discovered license plates matching those of a stolen vehicle. Suspicious, suspicious vehicle behind a building, and uh, as a matter of routine, I was running a check on the tag. Were there shots uh, fired? Yes, sir, there were two shots fired. Did he resist arrest with violence? Yes, sir, he did. What did he do? Uh, well, initially, when I was putting, placing the handcuffs on him, he kicked my feet out from under me and struck me with uh, a handcuff that had been placed on one wrist. David Lee finds himself in a violent scuffle before subduing the driver. Unwilling to give his identity right away, the man eventually reveals himself to be the FBI-wanted Bundy. Authorities are still assessing the impact of having caught one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. The identification of the mystery man as Theodore Robert Bundy hit law officials like a bombshell. The trial, which is expected to be the first to be broadcast nationally, begins with jury selection at Miami Dade's County Metro Justice Building. Two counts burglary, two counts murder in the first degree, three counts attempted murder in the first degree design or intent to affect the death of said Lisa Lee. My chance to talk to the press. Contrary to section 78204 Florida statute. I'll plead not guilty right now. And your grand jury is being... Bundy complains to Judge Edward Cowart about the conditions of his prison cell right away, kicking off a bizarre month of proceedings in which he spars with the counsel. 
takes the range to cross-examine a police officer and sits for testimony while referring to himself in the third person. Despite the defense's objections to his testimony, forensic dentist Richard Suverin compares large photographs of Bundy's teeth to bite marks found on one of the FSU students and declares them to be a match. And then the moment of truth arrived when, on July 24, 1979, after less than seven hours in deliberation, the jury of seven men and five women found Bundy guilty of first-degree murder in the deaths of Bowman and Levy, as well as attempted murder in the deaths of Kleiner, Chandler, and Thomas. The following week, he was sentenced to death by electric chair in Florida. During the penalty phase of the trial, Bundy proposes to girlfriend Carol Boone in the presence of a notary public, rendering their marriage legal. Shortly afterward, the jurors recommend the death sentence for the newly married convict. This court, independent of, but in agreement with, the advisory sentence rendered by the jury does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. Bundy sits for an interview with evangelist James Dobson after admitting to numerous murders, including three that predate the Northwest Spree of 1974, and blames his demented behavior on his addictions to alcohol and pornography. Those of us who are or have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home. It snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. By a 5-4 to four vote that evening, the United States Supreme Court rejected an emergency stay of execution for the prisoner. And then, on January 24, 1989, at Florida State Prison, Bundy is strapped into an electric chair nicknamed Old Sparky at around 7 a.m. After telling witnesses to give my love to my family and friends, the notorious killer is declared dead by electrocution at 7.16, drawing cheers from the estimated 200 people gathered outside to celebrate the moment. In a nutshell, Ted Bundy was one of the most repulsive people on the planet since the dawn of time. Ending this video with the prayer that this person burns in hell for all eternity and that the victim's families find peace. Thank you for watching the video. 